Hello everyone, my name is Haley Elizabeth and if you don't know who I am, I post videos pertaining to a little bit of whatever I want, conspiracy theories, controversial people, true crime, vlogs, so if you're interested in any of that, you can subscribe and if not, totally chill. We are just here to do some makeup, talk about some true crime, and for today's case, we're going to be talking about the case of the Taylor Swift stalker. Now, there is a lot to get through, so we're just going to hop right into it. But before getting into the rest of today's video, I do want to give a big thank you to the sponsor of today's episode, Drift. Now, if you guys are wondering why I'm in my car right now, that's because Drift is a monthly subscription service that offers air care products for your car and your home. All materials are sustainable, and all their products are made with natural essential and fragrance oils. This month from Drift, I got Mountain Greens and Sugared Citrus. When you receive your first package from Drift, that will be your starter kit and it comes with a metal clip as well as a scent and then you will receive a new scent every month as they recommend to change it out every 30 days. And personally, where I've been living, it's been raining like every single day recently and every time it rains, I always have to keep all of my car windows up but sometimes if it's super hot and humid outside, when when you get in your car it can smell sort of stuffy or murky but now with drift i never have that problem i literally get in my car and i feel like i'm frolicking in like a field in spring and in the past like with other air fresheners that i've had it's always been like a hit or miss if the scent really lasts a super long time and that's a main problem that i've had but with drift i've had this for almost a month and it has not lost its scent and your subscription to drift is very very flexible you can easily change your your delivery frequency, change your scent, or even cancel your subscription at any time you'd like. I've had about three people in my car since putting Drift in it, and all three of them have complimented how my car smells. It's not just me, the critics are raving. Now, if you guys want Drift for yourself, all you need to do is use my code HE55 for 55% off your subscription at Drift. And once again, that is HE55 for 55% off your subscription at Drift. And once again, thank you to Drift for sponsoring today's video. Now back to your video. On April 22nd of 2018, at around 3.20 a.m., that is when a gold Chevy Silverado pulls into the parking lot of a local Waffle House near Nashville. Now, although it was 3.20 in the morning, it was extremely packed inside of the Waffle House because everyone who had been partying the night before on Saturday night were just hungry and looking for some food and Waffle house for those who don't know is open 24 hours so although it was late at night there was a lot of people in there and this person in the chevy silverado they just pulled in front of the waffle house at 320 and stared at the waffle house for about four minutes until 324 a.m when the person exited their truck and on the outside this man just looked normal he looked like an average guy but underneath his jacket was actually an AR-15 and he was planning on walking into that Waffle House to shoot everyone in revenge of Taylor Swift stalking him. The man who was holding the AR-15 was was by the name of Travis Ranking. Travis Ranking was born on April 1st, 1989 in Morton, Illinois to his parents, Judy and Jeffrey. He grew up in Morton, Illinois with his parents and his three siblings. And for those who don't know, Morton, Illinois, kind of like a middle class, upper class sort of town. So Travis was kind of born into money. And as a kid, he sort of just got everything that he wanted. Travis's dad, Jeffrey, was actually the owner of his own a construction company called J and J Cranes where basically it was like crane rentals. And as far as the family, a lot of people describe the family as very warm, very inviting. They were very respected in the community as well because they tended to give back to the community as much as they could. Travis was indeed homeschooled his entire life with his siblings and it was said that Travis actually went to public school for a semester before his parents were the one that pulled him out of public school and decided to put him back into homeschooling. Now, I'm not sure why his parents decided to take him out of school, but he eventually did get his high school diploma through homeschool. After he graduated, that is when he started working in construction 
position with his father. When he started working for his father, he was able to get enough money to get his own apartment, and this apartment was actually located right above the construction sector of J&J &J Cranes, and so Travis just rented out that space and gave the money to his dad every month. And so Travis, at this time in his life, was doing really, really well. Although he didn't go to college, he was making really good money working with his dad. He had his own place and getting a very good paying job right out of high school is automatically a win whether you go to college or not. And so over the next few years, this is exactly how Travis's life pursued. He started to get more money. He even started to promote himself in his father's company. And I'm assuming with Jeffrey like taking Travis on so quickly, he probably had high hopes of Travis taking over the company one day so that he'd be able to retire. And this is actually what it looked like was going to happen until 2014 when Travis was in his mid-20s. He started to experience some hallucinations and also hearing and seeing things. It was just small occurrences at first, nothing too noticeable, but Travis also did live by himself. And so there was no one that was like watching him every single day and taking note of these odd behaviors. Around this age of 24, 25, it was believed that this is when Travis started to develop schizophrenia. Now, for those who don't know, schizophrenia starts in most people around their mid-20s. So this would have been around the time where he would start feeling symptoms. Since again, he didn't really live with anyone and he didn't really see anyone besides his family and his co-workers, his condition over the next year started to just get worse and worse until 2015 when his condition really started to spiral. In 2015, that is when Travis had went to a Taylor Swift concert with a couple of his friends and while he was there, Travis was, you know, just watching Taylor. She was singing, she was dancing, she was putting on a performance and Travis said that at one point in the concert, he could have sworn he saw Taylor stop, stare right into Travis's eyes and mouth the words, hello. Now, did Taylor actually say hello? Maybe. She's a celebrity. She's on stage performing to like thousands of people. Of course, she's saying hi and I love you to everyone in the crowd. But as for Travis, he did not take this as just, you know, Taylor saying hi to a fan. He took this as Taylor knowing him personally and singing songs to him. And she said hi to specifically him. After this, he would later become obsessed with Taylor Swift. He would know every fact and detail about her. He would follow a bunch of Taylor Swift update accounts to figure out her next move and where she was all the time. And then after this, although him and Taylor obviously weren't talking, he began to tell people that he was actually dating Taylor Swift. He would tell all of his friends, family, co-workers that him and Taylor were in a very serious relationship. He would go on to tell people that him and Taylor were talking on an everyday basis over the phone, over text message. And Travis, on his own time, would actually start sending letters to Taylor Swift, like through her fan mail. He was kind of using Taylor's fan mail as sort of, you know, I'm talking to Taylor Swift. And he would also send lots of letters that basically sounded as if Taylor had responded. One of his letters from the fan mail says, quote, Taylor, I'm really confused right now. I don't know if it was you in the pictures on Instagram or someone who looks like you. Do you really have a twin sister? Which one am I in love with then? I want the Taylor that wrote those beautiful songs and sang to me at her concert. Maybe Taylor 1 wrote half and Taylor 2 wrote half. Maybe I saw Taylor 1 in Morton and Taylor 2 in concert. Who was the girl in the music videos then? It was then where Travis started to create this entire world, this entire new reality. For him and Taylor Swift were madly in love with each other. They talked every single day and he wasn't very shy about this either. Like, as I said, Travis would go out and tell like his friends, his family, his coworkers. He would openly tell people that he was in love with her and she was in love with him. Now, people's reaction to this was very confused because it's Taylor Swift. And so a lot of his 
friends and family were very confused as to how he even met Taylor Swift in the first place. And they also started to notice that he became extremely dodgy or defensive every time someone would ask him a simple question about his and Taylor's relationship. Such as like, do you have a picture of you two together? Or why doesn't she come over to the house for the holidays? Just simple things like that always led to a huge argument. So people just stopped bringing it up in general. And at first, families and friends actually did believe Travis. They thought that maybe he did start dating a celebrity. But then as time went on, that is when family and friends of Travis really started to notice that this is not a thing that was happening. He was not even talking to Taylor Swift and these were truly just delusions that he had. But since people tended to ignore it or not talk about it, this basically just led Travis's mental health as well as his delusions and the new reality that he created. It basically just got worse and worse after this because he was getting no help. It started to get worse and worse to the point where the only thing that Travis would talk about was Taylor Swift. Even if it wasn't about their relationship, it was basically about like her life or what she's doing or what she's up to. May of 2016, that is when Judy and Jeffrey, Travis's parents, went to the county sheriff and asked him for help on what they should do to their son. The parents started to explain to the sheriff everything that was going on and saying that their son believes that he is in a relationship with Taylor Swift and it's gotten extremely bad and they're growing very concerned because these stories are starting to just make no sense. And an example of a story that he told his parents was that he told his family that he met up with Taylor Swift at a local Dairy Queen, but when she saw him, she immediately ran away and spider crawled up the side of a building and then just hopped over the building because she got scared that she saw him. And he says that the reason why Taylor was able to climb up buildings is because she's a part of the Illuminati. And when you're a part of the Illuminati, you become a lizard person and you're able to have like certain abilities such as spider crawling up buildings. And every time the parents would ask Travis like, hey, why doesn't Taylor come over to the house? Why doesn't she meet us? Travis always had an excuse and said that since she was a part of the Illuminati, her interactions with strangers has to be very, very minimal. And even her talking to Travis alone is putting her in a lot of trouble. That wasn't the reason why the parents were calling. They were calling because his stories were just getting too outrageous, but they were also calling because he believed that his parents and the police were like working together to try to take down his and Taylor's relationship. And so when the police heard this, they automatically said to them, you know, clearly Travis is not in a good mind state. Clearly he needs lots of help. And so the county sheriff had suggested to the parents to take Travis to a mental facility and check him in for treatment. At first, Travis, of course, did resist any sort of help, but after a while, they were able to convince him and he actually did go to a treatment center, but only for nine days before being released. And during his stay there, he was diagnosed with schizophrenia. Because his condition had worsened so much over the years, you would think that maybe they would do something to help his condition. But no, Travis was literally just given nine days of treatment, some medication, and then was kicked out the door. And even afterwards, he was given no like follow-up therapies, no follow-up doctor's appointments, just literally medication and that's it. And so obviously, Travis was not taking any of these medications and so it was basically like he went to the treatment center for nothing. And so because of his family sending him to a mental facility, this created a lot of tension between Travis and his family. His family was very concerned for him and only wanted the best for him, but Travis just felt like he was, you know, the only sane person in the room. So because of the constant fighting and constant tension between him and his family, he decided to pack up all of his things and move to Salida, Colorado. While he was there, that is when he met up with a family friend and got a job in the crane industry. But although 
he did move away to Colorado, that did not stop or slow down his Taylor Swift obsession. At this new job, he started to tell all of his co-workers how he was dating Taylor Swift, how they were getting married soon, how they were so in love, and obviously his co-workers just laughed in his face because it's Taylor Swift and they're all super confused and again every single time he was asked about like pictures or messages or anything like that he became extremely defensive and always had an excuse for everything and so actually one day at work his co-workers and Travis were getting into it as they usually do his co-workers were like you're not dating Taylor Swift like stop lying Travis continuously says I am dating Taylor Swift and he even says that him and Taylor are getting married soon. So this group of co-workers is like, okay, if you're getting married to Taylor Swift soon, why don't you show us the ring that you got her? Like, did you propose yet? And in that moment, Travis then pulls out of his pocket a $14,000 thousand dollar diamond engagement ring that he was going to give to Taylor when he proposed to her. Now this was not like premeditated. This group didn't say oh bring in the ring tomorrow. This was a ring that Travis bought on his own time. Like without the pressure of his co-workers he genuinely went out and spent fourteen thousand dollars of his own money to buy a ring that is literally gonna go to no one because he's not dating Taylor Swift. And so when his co-workers saw this ring, they started to feel very indecisive about the whole thing. They started to kind of wonder like, is he dating Taylor Swift? Because why else would he get a $14,000 ring? Or maybe he's not dating Taylor Swift and he's just suffering some really bad mental health issues. But Travis's co-workers also started to take notice note of Travis's behaviors towards Taylor Swift, which was very on and off because it was said that one day Travis would come in and he would speak very highly of Taylor, saying that they were in love and that they were going to get married soon. But then the next day when he came in, he would go on and on saying that he hated Taylor, that him and Taylor broke it off, but Taylor is stalking him. He would go on to say that Taylor Swift was hacking into his computer and breaking into his apartment, to which he even called the police for once. 911 emergency. Yeah, um, I need to report something, and every time I go to the sheriff's office, it's closed. Okay, what do you need to report? Um, I have somebody stalking me around town, and I do not appreciate it. I wanted to stop, and no one seems to take me seriously when I say that. Okay, and who is it that's stalking you? Taylor Swift. Okay, and what is your name? Travis Ranking. I mean, everywhere I go, like, they're stalking on the internet, they're stalking me, like, in person. Everywhere I go, I'm pretty sure, like, the police here are involved in it. And, like, I want it to stop. It's stupid. No one has the right to do that to me. What exactly are they doing? They're getting, like, on my, they're doing some kind of, like, I don't know. I don't know exactly how they're doing it, but somehow they're, like, getting on my Facebook, they're getting on my YouTube, they're getting on my Netflix, and they're changing the videos that I see as they pop up. Now, as you can tell from that police call, there was a very long pause after he said Taylor Swift, and so also in the call, you hear that Travis says that he believes the police are in on it, too, but after this call, Call, nothing really happened from it and his condition just got worse and worse to the point where he started to believe that the police, the Colorado police, was working with Taylor Swift in order to stalk him and make him feel like he was going crazy. So since he believed that the police were in on this too, he decided to pack up all of his things and move away. He quit his job and he basically just hopped out of town. So when he quit his job and moved out of town, 
Brown, the family friend that got him the job in the first place, he started to grow very concerned for Travis because he basically just left and while leaving, he said that he was going to marry Taylor Swift. So that is when the family friend calls Jeffrey, Travis's dad, and basically just lets him know on everything of what's going on. I don't know where he's moving to, but he seems like he needs a lot of help. He also tells Jeffrey about the $14,000 engagement ring, and he basically just tells Jeffrey that he's very concerned for Travis, and he feels that Travis is going through some sort of mental break, and he definitely needs some help. So that is when Jeffrey contacts Travis and tries to convince him to move back to his apartment in Morton, Illinois, and that's when Travis agrees. Travis moves back into his old apartment right above Jay and Jay Cranes, but just because he moved back home doesn't mean that he was getting the help that he needed because three months into him working there, that is when one day, randomly, Travis shows up at work wearing a pink dress and holding an AR-15, and he walks into the building and starts screaming at one of his co-workers. Now, this co-worker immediately runs out of the building, goes to his car, and drives away, and he was able to get away, but Travis actually went from the building and walked over to, like, a nearby public pool, and he did the same exact thing. He showed up in a pink dress and an AR-15 and started just screaming at everyone, and obviously everyone ran for their lives, families ran. Travis basically ran up to the pool, started screaming random nonsense before jumping into the pool. At no point did he ever shoot the gun or point the gun at anyone. He basically was just holding it sort of as like power, I guess, before eventually jumping into the pool. Now, when the police showed up, they tried to negotiate with Travis to get him out of the pool because he was carrying a gun. Travis refused to get out of the pool and even at one point stripped completely naked and started shaking himself around to basically mock the police in that he wasn't going to get out. But eventually Travis was taken out of the pool and arrested. Now you would think that something like this, you know, wearing a pink dress and going to your work with a gun and screaming at a co-worker and then on top of that going to a local pool where there's like families and children and just showing up there with a gun and a pink dress and start like screaming and jumping into the pool and on top of that stripping naked because you didn't want to get out of the pool. That's not like a sane thing to do. That's not something that like a sober or sane person would do. So clearly Travis is struggling with a lot of mental health issues. You would think that even bringing a gun out to a local pool would get you some sort of charges, but Travis was simply just let go. He was given no charges, no gun charges for having a gun in public, bringing a weapon to the workplace. He was just let off as if nothing even happened. And even though all of his family, his friends, the police station, they clearly saw that Travis was not well and he wasn't going to do much better unless he was given help, but no one gave Travis help. It just seemed like everyone was just staying away from Travis and hoping that the problem that Travis had would just go away on its own. But unfortunately, when you are dealing with serious mental health issues, it doesn't just go away on its own. It eventually gets worse and worse, and that's exactly what happened to Travis. He would begin going on Facebook Live, where he would go on all these rants about just nonsense. There was even a specific Facebook video that that he did that was about 15 minutes long and it's basically just him ranting about how he believes Taylor Swift had broken into his apartment while he was gone. Now the full 15 minute video I will be leaving linked down below if you guys want to watch it in full but I'm just going to give you the most important bits right now. This is why I'm angry right now. I come back up to my apartment you know, and, and this is on my dad's property. My dad owns this property, you know, but this is where I reside. No one can come in here. The door is locked. 
There's no one, there's nothing saying anyone can come in here. Anyway, I come in here, I come into my bathroom, and I notice in my bathroom that the toilet seat is up. The toilet seat is up on my toilet. I haven't put my toilet seat up. I know for a fact that this toilet seat was down. I know for a fact that the toilet seat was down. I, I never put my toilet seat up because I don't like it messing up my toilet. I always leave the seat down. I always sit down to pee or do anything. I never lift my toilet seat up. And yet this is what this is what's happened. So somebody has been coming in here. And then like I said to my dad the other day, there's fingerprints on the sides of my laptop. There's fingerprints on the sides. I never open the lid that way. I open the lid of my laptop. I always grab it here and open it, you know? And then if I carry it, I carry it like, like this, you know, from the bottom. My fingers are never like that. I always carry it like this, but somebody did, because there's fingerprints, four fingerprints across the top of the lid like that. My journals that I keep on my computer is labeled under journals. I keep these notes in there, you know, to keep track of all this stuff that's been happening to me. And then I try to find another journal that talks about my dad or something like that, another entry, and the entry's gone. Like, I can't find a certain entry that I wrote one time when I was out in Colorado. It just happens to, happen to disappear, you know, like it's gone or got deleted or whatever. You know, it's like, why is somebody coming in my apartment and doing this stuff? You know, this is illegal. Why is somebody getting on my private property like that? Why is someone going to my bathroom? And that's the thing, is I know for a fact that I never lift the toilet seat. I never put the toilet seat up. I never do that. It's always down. It's probably because, you know, she's, oh, it's Taylor Swift, you know, she wants to pretend like she's a dude, she's a transvestite or whatever. I don't care. Like, if, if that's what she wants to do, put on a pair of pants then, or whatever you want to wear, you know, put on boy clothes, you know, get on the internet and tell everyone you're a fucking guy, then do that. You know, I don't care. Whatever you want to do. It's not my problem. Why are these people breaking into my apartment, you know, flipping the toilet seat up like there's some guy in here using it? And that's that's the whole thing, is it? They keep pushing this stuff on me, like, oh, this gayness or, like, transsexual stuff, and it's like, what the fuck? You know, none of this makes sense. If she's that, that's fine, but stop projecting your garbage onto me. You know, accept what you are. If you want to be a dude, if you want to leave the toilet seat up, then do that, you know? If you want to be a dude and you want to leave the toilet seat up, then do that in your own fucking apartment. Dress like a, a man or whatever on your own fucking now, as you can see from that rant, he's literally making no sense. He's saying that Taylor Swift was the one that broke into his house, but she left the toilet seat up because she's wearing boyish clothing, so she wants to become a boy. And he even goes on to say that he doesn't ever leave the toilet seat up, which is very hard to believe because he's a guy, and usually guys, like, leave the toilet seat up so you don't get pee on the toilet seat when you're Peeing. then goes on another rant where he believes that the community is all working together to try to take him down because he says he recently just got his own pickup truck and today when he was driving it he stopped behind another truck and the truck had a bumper sticker that said quote silly boys trucks are for girls just as like a very fun silly comment very playful but travis did not see that as silly and playful he saw that as the community placing that sticker on that car at that time that he was behind that truck just to make him feel bad about himself and feel bad that he got a truck is there these sexist people you know i saw this thing uh, the other day when I was going through peeking, and it was like, silly boys, you know, girls drive big trucks. And it was right after I bought my truck, you know, so is that a coincidence? I don't know. These people just come up with these bumper stickers just to annoy me. You know, like I said, I think it's part, part of the community is doing this, so I won't be surprised if someone out slapped this bumper sticker on their truck to try to make me feel that way, you know? But like, that's insane. These, these people are psychopaths, and they're insane. Trucks aren't just for boys or girls, okay? Silly boys, trucks are for girls. No, they're not. They're for everyone. Trucks are for everyone, retard, okay? This is stupid. This is sexist, and it's wrong to be that way. And secondly, if you want to be a guy, that's fine, okay? If you want to be a guy, you want to pretend to be a guy or whatever, then do that. But 
But when you come into my apartment and do this shit, okay, for one, guys aren't criminals. All guys are not criminals, you feminist Nazi. And when you come in here and do this stuff, that just tells me you're a fucking criminal, that you believe guys are criminals, and that's wrong. Like, all guys aren't criminals, you know? And I don't like you because of the way you portray men. You're sick. And so, as you can see with the way that he's getting extremely angry about these very small things and how, like, all of these things that he's saying doesn't really make sense, but they're all very vaguely, vaguely connected, this rant that you see is very, very similar to that of schizophrenia rant. So as you can see from that rant alone, his conditions keep getting worse and worse. But once again, although his conditions continue to get worse, no one in his life is stepping up and getting him help. No one really close to him decided to check him into a mental facility. His condition would just soon get worse and worse because the following year on July of 2017, that is when Travis decided to take a little trip to Washington DC, specifically the White House, and he got off of a bus, went up to the White House, and demanded to speak with every member that was in the American government, which I'm pretty sure is quite impossible. Now, the whole situation is kind of hard to explain, so I'm just gonna read to you the police report from that day. The police report says, quote, on July 7th, 2017, at approximately 3.30 p.m., Travis approached AO, which stands for A officer at the Northeast pedestrian entrance on Pennsylvania Avenue. Travis stated he must get into the White House and speak with P-O-T-U-S. A-O explained that you must obtain a tour and told Travis to move from blocking the pedestrian entrance. Travis again stated that he wanted to speak to the president and said that he was a sovereign citizen and has the right to inspect the grounds. A-O told him again to move from the blocking pedestrian entrance. Travis began to take his tie off and balled it into his fist and began approaching AO and walked past the security barriers. Travis walked past stating, quote, do what you need to do, arrest me if you have to. AO grabbed Travis by the wrist and bicep and escorted him outside the security barrier. AAO1, which is basically like another officer, AAO1 arrived on scene and began to question Travis. Travis was told to leave the secured area and refused. AO placed Travis under arrest for unlawful lawful entry. Travis was transported to the Metropolitan 2nd District for processing. So once again, from that interaction alone, you can definitely tell that Travis and his mental health is slowly starting to deteriorate. Now he's literally taking flights to the White House in order to prove his point. Even the aftermath of this whole incident, Travis was still never given any help. Travis was even telling the police and the guards at the end entrance that he needs to speak with the government because he's so confused as to why he can't recognize anyone in the government. He says that since all of these people are strangers, basically, that he doesn't have to listen to them if he doesn't want to. And after this, you would think that, like, you know, attempting to break into the White House would probably give you some sort of jail time or some sort of something. But due to this, all Travis got was 32 community service hours. He got no jail time. He was given no penalty, just a little bit of community service. Now, also due to this incident, Travis's guns were all taken away from him. Travis did own a lot of guns. He owned shotguns, handguns, assault arms, rifles. Those were all taken away from him, but they were given to his dad, Jeffrey, because Jeffrey said that he would keep them safe. But Jeffrey, don't know why he did did this, but he ended up just giving all of the guns right back to Travis. Literally, the police had to come in and take all of those guns away from Travis because they were scared as to what he might do with them. And Jeffrey basically just gave all of the guns back to his son. And once again, Travis, after doing something that is completely not okay, just went about his business as if it never happened at all. And then in August of 2017, 
2018, that year, that is when Travis would pack up all of his things in Illinois and move to Nashville, Tennessee. And for those who don't know, Nashville, Tennessee is actually where Taylor Swift grew up. It's where she got her singing career and it's also where her actual family still resides and lives. And then while he was there, that is when he got a job with a construction company. But in February of 2018, the following year, Travis found himself in trouble once again. In a town called Alcoa, which is about three hours east of Nashville, a 911 call was made on Travis. A young mom who was staying at a local motel with her two children said that there was this guy who was staying like a couple doors down from her. He randomly came out of his motel room and just started screaming. He was saying that there was people looking through his windows and people were following him and harassing him and he just can't deal with it anymore. And so he was screaming for quite a while, going on and on about random stuff. And so this mother, since it was late at night when all of this was happening, decided to come out of her motel room and confront the guy. And so she goes up to Travis and she basically just says like, hey, I have two kids. We're trying to sleep. Can you please keep it down? Like just call the police if it's really that big of a deal. But Travis to this, instead of talking to the woman, he instead bolted straight into her motel room where her kids were at and started screaming and threatening at her before he eventually left. And that's why she called the police in the first place. I came out here to my car and this man down here was running up and down these, up the top and then down here screaming at everyone's door telling him he'll make as much noise as he wants. And I looked at him, I said, I have kids and they're getting ready for bed. And he was right there at that white truck, literally ran into our hotel and tried to hit me. Acted like he was going to put his hands on me. Where's he at now? He's down there with the man that owns this place. Now, when Travis was approached about the situation to get his side of the story, that is when Travis would tell police that yes, he was yelling, but it was because over the past couple of nights, people have been staring at him through his windows and they've also been knocking at his windows. And he just got so frustrated that tonight he decided to walk out there and attempt at confronting the person, but he couldn't find them. The single mother didn't press charges against Travis and Travis was just asked to leave the motel and stay somewhere else and that was basically the end of that. It was said that Travis would then start to just hop around from local motels and hotels just staying wherever he could. He worked at this construction company for two more months until April of 2018 when he was actually fired from the construction company and it's unknown why exactly he got fired, but he did eventually get fired. And then shortly after that, he was able to get another job pretty quickly before only showing up to that job for an entire day and then never showing up again. On April 17th of 2018, that is when Travis had showed up to a local BMW dealership and was able to actually get a hold of one of the keys to the car. So he took one of the BMW keys and he took one of the BMWs right off the lot and started to drive away with it. And this caused a huge police chase between Travis and the police. The police chased him for miles and miles until Travis eventually lost the police. And he basically just parked the BMW in the parking lot of his apartment building. The police were able to find the car through like a GPS tracking service. But when they found the car in the apartment parking lot, they weren't sure who committed this crime. So they didn't know if the person that committed the crime lived in the apartment building or if the person that committed the crime just dropped it off at a random apartment building trying to throw the police off. Since the police didn't know who did this, they basically just took the car back to the dealership and nothing further happened. Now on April 22nd of 2018, five days later, that is when Travis had drove his gold Chevy Silverado at around 3.20 a.m. into the parking lot of a local Waffle House. He sat in 
his car for about four minutes just staring at the Waffle House before eventually getting out of his car. And before even walking into the Waffle House, Travis had shot and killed two people. Travis shot and killed two people that were standing outside, 20-year-old Joe Perez Jr., who was stopped at Waffle House because he had a flat tire, as well as 29-year-old Tareen Sanderlin, who was an employee at the Waffle House, stepping out for a smoke break. Travis then walked into the Waffle House and started to shoot at everything and everyone that he saw, and inside of the Waffle House, he ended up taking two more lives. As soon as he walked in the Waffle House, everyone started to run. Some people started to run for their cars, others ran for the back kitchen, others ran for the bathroom, while others tried to get into the bathroom but couldn't because the doors were locked. In the Waffle House is when Travis took two more lives. 23-year-old Aquila Da Silva, who was eating at the Waffle House with his girlfriend and his brother. Although both his brother and his girlfriend survived, his girlfriend's injuries were so bad that it actually impaired her ability to walk later on in life, and his brother was left extremely traumatized. The last person Travis killed was 21-year-old De Ebony Groves, who was eating at the restaurant as well. It was a total of four deaths, but there could have been so much more if not for the brave actions of 29-year-old James Shaw. James Shaw was running away from Travis like everyone else, and he was actually running to the bathroom, and as James was running to the bathroom, Travis had actually shot James, but right at that moment, James actually slipped and fell, so the bullet didn't catch him all the way, it just grazed his elbow. Then when James fell, it kind of created a little bit of a distraction for Travis. He was thrown off a little bit. James decided to take this to his advantage, and he lunged at Travis and tried to take the gun away. James and Travis were going back and forth, pinning each other against the wall, against the tables, the counters. James had both of his hands on the steaming hot barrel of the gun that was probably giving him third degree burns, but he still attempted at taking the gun away from Travis, and eventually he was able to. Once the gun was out of Travis's hands, that is when James had pinned Travis onto the ground in an attempt to keep him still until the police got there, but unfortunately, Travis was able to break away and he ran into a nearby wooded area. Shaw says he ran toward Ryan King without a plan in mind. This is where they would next struggle over the weapon. Pulling up, pulling up, and I finally get the gun and I throw it. And that gun then falls over the counter. It was a voice that told me to do it. Do it now. And I acted upon that voice. Shaw then pushes Ryan King out of the Waffle House as bystanders continue to take cover inside. Ryan King then runs off, jumping over Joe Perez, who is one of the four killed in the shooting. This whole occurrence from the time that Travis stepped out of his car to the time where Travis ran into the woods, it only lasted 42 seconds. When the police got there, to which the police actually showed up late because they went to the wrong Waffle House, when they eventually did show up, they tried to first things first figure out who the shooter was. So they went to go look at the security footage. The police noticed that the person who came out and started shooting was actually the owner of the Chevy Gold Silverado. So they went outside, they ran the plates of the Silverado and found that the owner of this truck was a man by the name of Travis Ranking. So once they found that this Travis guy was the shooter, that is when the manhunt for Travis began. There were police cars, there was helicopters, there was search dogs, there was news coverage, people, you know, displaying his photo. If you see this man, call the police immediately. But what police didn't know is that shortly after going to the Waffle House when he ran into the nearby woods, Travis actually ran back to his apartment and at his apartment is where he showered, he packed a bag and in the bag included a handgun and he was able to do all of this before police arrived at his place. Now that Travis was out on the run, police encouraged everyone to lock their doors, be aware of their surroundings, don't go out at night if you don't have to, 
two. He actually made it on the FBI's top 10 most wanted list. The hunt for Travis lasted around 36 hours until a phone call was made to the police station from a woman basically reporting that she could have sworn she seen Travis walking in the woods. Police made their way to this wooded area and they eventually did find Travis. Apparently he was like camping in the middle of the woods as he was trying to hide out and he had been there for the past 36 hours. When Travis was arrested, he was charged with four counts of murder as well as a huge amount of other charges. His trial was supposed to be in August of that year, but it was postponed because he was deemed not fit to stand trial because he suffered from schizophrenia. But the judge would actually reverse this diagnosis and deem him fit to stand trial. If you're deemed not fit to stand trial, usually what that means is that at the time of the crime, you weren't aware between right and wrong and your mental health kind of got in the way of blurring the lines between what's right and wrong. But the judge actually argued that at the time of the crime, Travis was fully aware between what was right and what was wrong because he fled from the scene before police got there. So the judge argued, yes, he was actually fit to stand trial. And so although he was fit to stand trial, he basically just stayed in jail awaiting trial until the following year of February of 2022. At the trial, all of the victim's families were there and they were all able to say their piece and say how this affected them. It was a very big story at the time because of his Taylor Swift obsession, but all of the victim's families were able to attend the trial and all of them said statements. Joe Perez's family came forward and they said that they actually just moved to Nashville recently because Joe's brother had started his own business in Nashville and Joe was actually in Nashville helping out his brother in his new business. And one night when he was driving around, he had gotten a flat tire. So he stopped at a local waffle house to actually call his brother so that he could like let him know I'm at the side of the road. I have this flat tire. Can you come help me? But unfortunately that call never went through. Joe's mother shortly after learning about what happened to her son had to actually receive mental health treatment from a mental health facility because the news just took that big of a toll onto her. And Joe's mom even said to the court, quote, this has broken me, not just my spirit, not just my family, but also my mind. My son Christian blames himself for bringing his brother to Nashville. He thinks that if they would have just waited like I asked, that none of this would have happened. Patricia, who is Joe's mother, said that her oldest son, Cruz, has gotten his EMT certification and is working towards becoming a paramedic. Cruz said that with every life he saves, it is in dedication for his brother, since his brother's life could not be saved. Tareen's family as well was able to go up to the stand and make a statement, but unfortunately both of his parents couldn't make it to the trial because they were still so distraught and traumatized over the situation. They just couldn't picture themselves speaking in front of a court and especially in front of a bunch of cameras. So Tareen's aunt Blanche actually came to speak for the parents. His aunt had said that Tareen had been working at the Waffle House for a total of five years and even said, quote, Wanda, who is Tareen's mother, has had so much stress. She breaks out in all these big welts on her body. The doctor said it's stress and nerves. They got her under so much medication trying to control it. I know for myself, I can't sleep. Anytime I would go to sleep, I would dream about Tareen. I would dream that we were talking and we would do things together. I wake up sometimes crying, so I quit going to sleep. Tareen was a very happy person, but he was a quiet person. His dad is big, so he's big, but he was gentle. He loved animals, he loved dogs, and he left behind a dog, Rocco. Akila's family also came forward and said that Akila was a wonderful musician. He was a music producer, he was a rapper, and he was an aspiring artist. He was insanely creative and very loving to everyone that he met. Keila's brother, the brother that was with him that night, came forward and said, quote, I see it every day. I relive it every day. I try to block it out, but I can't. My brother, he wouldn't even get his ears pierced because of the pain. So to know that he had to go through that pain in those last moments, 
I see it every day, how he looked that night. Reliving it every day just tears me apart. It hurts the fact to know that he died and I didn't. I just will never understand. I don't understand the significance of this. He didn't deserve it. And I think that's what affects us all the most. And to the trial, Akilah's whole family was wearing baby blue because that was his favorite color. Ebony's family as well also came forward and said their statements. They said that De Ebony was a very smart and successful woman. She was in her last year a senior student at Belmont University majoring in social work. She was also a star athlete for her college. Debony's brother came forward to the court and said, quote, it just literally felt like someone took a vacuum and sucked the life out of me. It was literally like I had lost a piece of me. I didn't realize just how intertwined our lives really were until after she passed. After this, that is when Travis had a time to go up in front of everyone and say his part. Travis was pleading not guilty for reasons of insanity and he said that at the time of the crime, said that he was suffering from schizophrenia for the past couple of years. He said that at the time of the crime, he was so far gone from reality and he couldn't even tell what was real and what wasn't. And so those killings in his head just seemed to be not real. He said that he had created a brand new reality for himself and he had been digging deeper and deeper into this delusion for the past five years until eventually eventually hitting his breaking point the night of April 22nd. But the prosecution was not buying any of this. They knew that this was premeditated because when they were looking at Travis's apartment, they found a picture that Travis had drawn. It was basically a stick figure with a gun standing outside of a waffle house. And inside of the waffle house, there were little like speech bubbles that said things like, oh no, that person is dead. Or, oh no, that guy has a gun and right above the Waffle House is what looks to be like a UFO with aliens inside that are watching Travis do this whole thing. They also pointed out that Travis was found with 60 additional rounds in his jacket even though he had only shot off 30 meaning that he was intending to shoot more and if he did run out of ammo he had spare ammo again planning ahead in case he ran out. The prosecution said that this was a choice. It it was a choice for Travis to go there that night. It was a choice for Travis to bring extra uh, ammo in case he needed more. Everything leading up to that night was Travis's choice. And so because of that, he should be penalized. The prosecution said that this was not a result of delusions or hallucinations because in the moment he knew what he was doing. He wasn't hallucinating anything. He knew that he would go into that Waffle House and take lives. That was his choice and that's what he did. And because of this, that is when Travis was found guilty for all the charges and sentenced to life in prison without possibility of parole. He was found guilty of four counts of murder and 13 other charges. As far as the aftermath of everything, James Shaw, the person who stepped in and took the gun away from Travis, actually ended up saving up a lot of money for the victim's family. Again, like he was kind of the hero of the story. So he basically took all of the attention and media attention that he was getting to help the victim's families get attention and raise money for their funerals. As for Travis's dad, Jeffrey, he was actually later arrested. As I said, Travis had all of his guns taken away from him and Travis's father basically just handed all of the guns back. One of the guns that Travis owned was an AR-15 and that gun was later used at the Waffle House to commit that crime. So so the whole reason why they took away the guns was to make sure Travis didn't do this and Jeffrey basically gave his son all the materials to do it. And so because of that, he was arrested and there's no trial date that's set in stone, but he could get anywhere from three years in prison to probation. But in my personal opinion, I think he's most likely just going to get probation, unfortunately, because I mean, if you look at Travis's track record and how well well, he was prosecuted in the past. I don't think Jeffrey's getting any jail time, unfortunately. That's just what I think. I definitely feel like he should be in jail, but I don't foresee that happening. I just realized that that lamp was out the entire time. Um, 
we're gonna pretend like that didn't happen. But yeah, that is the end of today's story. If you guys found this case interesting, make sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe. If you want to follow me on any of my socials, like my Instagram, that will be all linked down below, as well as my PO box if you want to send me anything. And as well as well, all of the research that I use for this video. So all of like the body cam footage that I show, all of like the Facebook rants that I show, all of that will be linked down below if you want to watch the full versions and not just like the snippets that I put in here and as well as well as well all of the makeup that I put on my face as well so if you're wondering what my lip is what my contour is all of that will be linked down below as for my own thoughts and opinions I don't really have many I personally think it's really sad that no one in Travis's life really saw what he was going through and decided to help him in Travis's perspective it is very hard to ask for help when you don't really know what you're asking help for because when you're in that mind state and you think that everything is truthful and you genuinely believe that people are out to get you and these things are happening, it's very hard to snap yourself out of it and bring yourself back to reality. And so I think it's really sad that even the police themselves didn't really take that much care or seriousness in taking care of Travis and his mental health to try to make sure that things like this don't happen. I also think it's extremely extremely crazy that Jeffrey just gave the guns back to Travis. Like if your son were to go to a public pool where there are children around or even show up at his workplace because J&J Cranes is his company. So that means his son showed up at his company with a gun and nothing happened to him. But I would also love to hear what you guys think. Do you believe that Travis was not guilty due to reasons of insanity or do you think Travis was was guilty and he did know what he was doing. Do you think that if Travis would have gotten proper help in the beginning that would have changed the outcome or do you think Travis would have always had this murderous rage inside of him? I would love to hear what you guys think in the comments below and yeah that is all from me. Again I hope you guys enjoyed today's video and I also want to apologize real quick. I have been not uploading that much. I've been uploading maybe like once every every two weeks and I'm so so sorry about that. I'm in the process of moving. I'm getting my own apartment soon so that's basically what I've been working on for the past couple of months so just because I'm not on YouTube don't think I'm forgetting. Big things are coming. <laughs> Ew I hate that I just said that big things are coming you guys the big thing in question <laughs> i feel like i haven't talked talked to you guys in a bit to give you guys any updates but yes i'm so sorry that my upload schedule has been quite literally a mess i will only be recording this video and another video in this space and after that it will be in a whole new place hello just popping in here one more time just to say thank you to drift for sponsoring today's video and if you guys want drift for yourself all you need to do is click my link down below and use my code HE55 for 55% off. A whole new setting. I'm also in the process of doing a couple of other things as well, new series that I want to do on my channel. But yeah, anyways, I just feel like I needed to tell you guys that. But yeah, that is all from me. Again, I hope you guys enjoyed today's video and I love you, I love you, I love you and do something that makes you happy today.